สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and we're finishing up with our very last class of this iteration of our group learning program. But no worries, we're going to be restarting the whole program again, and we even have some specialized classes that we're going to be doing over the next two months. But this particular class, titled "The Five Hindrances," this is where you learn about all the obstacles that you're going to encounter as you're making your way to enlightenment. There's Lots and lots of obstacles, but here you're going to learn about the five major hindrances. Because over the last seven months in this group learning program, I've been teaching you what it takes in order to move the mind to enlightenment and the various teachings that you need. Well, here at the very end, it's important to understand and look at what are the actual obstacles to accomplishing all the things that I taught you about over the last seven months. So we're going to be focusing on that today as part of our class. And the first thing I'm going to be sharing with you guys today is the seven factors of enlightenment, and going through that in a very thorough way, because the seven factors of enlightenment are actually the solution to many of the hindrances and obstacles that you're going to experience. Because what this class is. Hopefully, going to do for you is one. You're going to learn what these hindrances are, but more importantly, you'll understand how to solve them and how to overcome them, so that when you do experience them, then they don't actually continue to be obstacles, but you can actually overcome them. So the way that you accomplish that is by learning what they are and then learning what the solutions are. And just like everything that I've ever shared is part of. Sharing teachings with you. If you've ever learned with me for even the smallest amount of time, one of the first things that I share and reiterate multiple times is never to believe anything that I share. Because if you just believe what I share, or you believe what I write in books, or you believe the videos and podcasts and other things that I share, you're not going to be able to get to wisdom. Because in order to get to enlightenment, you need to eradicate this unknowing of true reality, this ignorance. And the way that you do that is through learning, through reflecting, which means you're independently verifying whether the teachings are true or not, and then you're practicing to move the teachings that I share into practice, so that then you can see the transformation of the mind yourself as discontentedness is gradually diminishing. So, in every single class and in every interaction that you have with me and. Probably other people as well. You're not interested in believing things, but instead you're interested in getting to wisdom and be able to independently verify things. So thank you all for deciding to join for our class or listen to the replay or attend one of the live streams that we've got going out throughout the internet. As we go today, feel free to ask any questions that you like. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. In the comment section, our moderators will see that, and be sure your question gets asked. And then, if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any question or follow-up question directly. So, with what I shared in terms of not believing anything that I share, the first thing that I would like to share with you are the words of the Buddha. About the five hindrances, at least some of his words. All of his words are in the Pali Canon, of course. But I would like to at least give you the confidence that the Buddha even taught something called the five hindrances. So the first thing that I'm going to share with you guys today are the words of the Buddha around the five hindrances, so that you'll understand that he at least taught the five hindrances. And then in other parts of this book series, you'll see where I talk about the five hindrances. In this first book, Volume One, which is the text for this group learning program, I don't mention the five hindrances, but later on in the other volumes, I do mention them. So here are some of his words around the five hindrances. He says, "Monks, there are these five hindrances. What five? The hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of complacency." The hindrance of restlessness and worry, the hindrance of doubt, these are the five hindrances. This noble eightfold path is to be developed for direct knowledge or experience of these five hindrances, for the full understanding of them, for their complete destruction, for their abandoning. So here he's explaining at least. Labeling and letting you know what these five hindrances are, and he's saying it's the eightfold path that is going to actually solve these for you. And remember, the eightfold path is that core central teaching where the other teachings plug into it. So the seven factors of enlightenment and 
the Four Noble Truths, the Three Universal Truths, the Five Precepts, all these other teachings, including meditation and others, are all plugging into this core central teaching. So here he's just labeling and letting you know what the five hindrances are and pointing to the Eightfold Path as the solution. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you guys through understanding more about these five hindrances. And then eventually we're going to be discussing the seven factors of enlightenment as solutions. And then I'm going to be explaining each individual hindrance for you so that you understand what they are. So let's just talk about the five hindrances in general. The five hindrances have similarities to the 10 fetters. So remember, when the Buddha describes the unenlightened mind, he describes it through craving, anger, and ignorance, or the unknowing of true reality. This was part of chapter 8, when we talked about the three poisons, or the three unwholesome roots, or the three fires. And then those higher level problems that he discovered about the unenlightened mind, they then get into more detail with the 10 fetters as he explains each individual pollution of mind and the antidote and how to solve it and how to fix it. So what you're gonna see here with the five hindrances is there's a bit of a regrouping of some of those aspects of the 10 fetters that something like central desire is a fetter but it also shows up as a hindrance as well. This is common for the Buddha, where he will group his teachings based on what it is that he's talking about. So when he's talking about all the pollutions of mind and what needs to be eliminated in order to get to enlightenment, he's gonna talk about the 10 fetters. But then when he talks specifically about hindrances and obstacles to getting to enlightenment, he will call this the five hindrances. And some of those might be from the 10 fetters, but then he's also gonna include other things as well that aren't part of the 10 fetters. This is the same thing like the Eightfold Path is a core central teaching. And then you see things like the seven factors of enlightenment and <clears throat> you see the five precepts, you see the three universal truths and other things that are kind of pointing to each other and giving you more clarity about the topic that he's actually explaining. If there's struggles or impediments along the path to enlightenment, it really helps to understand these five hindrances because more likely than not, you're going to be experiencing multiple of these five hindrances along your journey. That when you encounter them, if you understand what they are, then you'll be able to identify them. And because of this talk, you'll know what the solutions are. And you'll be able to reference back to this talk because I've given the same talk more than one time and you'll be able to pull up the YouTube video or the podcast or you can reach out for personal guidance. So one of the first steps in being able to overcome an obstacle or overcome a hindrance is first know what they are and how to identify them. And then once you identify them, you'll know what the solution is to actually solve it. So the first thing to talk about is the seven factors of enlightenment, because this is what's going to show up as solutions for a good majority of the five hindrances, along with the Eightfold Path, but also the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment are sometimes mistakenly understood by people as this is what determines whether you are enlightened or not, because the way it's labeled as the seven factors, it sounds like this is going to determine whether you are enlightened or not, but that's not what these are. Instead, what these are, these are tools to fine tune the mind. Remember, the mind needs to be brought to the middle in order to get to enlightenment. Whereas if the mind's holding on really tight with craving, desire, attachment, it has this mental longing and strong eagerness, the mind's not going to perform optimally. But also if the mind was kind of dull and lethargic, if it was complacent, it wouldn't perform optimally either. You would feel pretty much lazy and dull and lethargic. What you're doing is you're bringing the mind to the middle so that now it can have focus, it can have concentration, it can have uh, clarity of mind, there can be deep memory, and the mind can function more optimally. It's like that musical instrument that if the string is tuned too tight and you pluck the strings, it doesn't play beautiful music. It doesn't play the way the instrument was intended to play. But also if the string is too loose and you pluck the instrument, the instrument's not going to play beautiful music. It's not playing the way it was intended to play. 
So the mind is the same way that if it's holding on to things too tight, it's not functioning the way it was intended to function, that it's too uptight, there's anxiety, there's stress, there's worry. But also, if you were very lackadaisical and complacent about things, then you would feel very dull and lethargic, and the mind would have difficulties there too. So by training the mind and fine tuning the mind, you bring it to the middle, and now as you train the mind to function in this middle way more and more and more through the Eightfold Path, the mind is less likely to pop out and go to craving or less likely to pop out and go to dullness or lethargic condition or complacency. It's kind of like a piece of wood and you have a piece of steel that you're grinding back and forth on this piece of wood. And initially, when you first start grinding back and forth, that piece of steel can pop all over the place because there's not a really well-worn path or a well-worn groove to keep this steel in the wood. But as you grind back and forth for longer and longer periods of time, you wear this groove down into the wood to the point where it's very hard for it to pop out. And when it does pop out, you notice it right away and you can bring it right back and get right back into that groove. And eventually you get so deep into that groove that the steel won't pop out. This is what you're doing with the mind is you're training the mind to function in this middle way. And with the seven factors of enlightenment and all the other steps on the Eightfold Path, the Buddha is guiding you of how to bring the mind to the middle and how to fine tune it so it can perform optimally. And then he's giving you the tools that where you notice the mind is sluggish or lethargic, you can bring it back. Or where it gets too excited or too elated, you can bring it back to calmness and to peacefulness and joy. So these seven factors of enlightenment, this first one of mindfulness, the Buddha talks about this one and says you should always be practicing mindfulness. Essentially, as the mind first starts waking up in the morning, all day long, and even as you're starting to doze off to sleep, you should be practicing mindfulness or awareness of mind. Because I'm sure that you've had situations where you've been dozing off to sleep and your thoughts have kind of invaded you and then it made it really difficult to fall asleep and it was very challenging to actually fall asleep. Well, if you're practicing awareness of mind and you're practicing the other steps of the Eightfold Path, when you observe this, you're able to cut that off and let it go so it doesn't disturb your sleep or disturb your day. We're gonna be talking about mindfulness in a lot of detail towards the end of our class. I'm gonna be talking about the four foundations of mindfulness because mindfulness is so key to your path to enlightenment but it's also very key to understanding the five hindrances and being able to identify them when they're occurring for you. If you didn't have mindfulness, you wouldn't be able to identify these five hindrances. So I'll teach you the five hindrances today and you'll understand what those are. But without mindfulness, you would never be able to observe that they're actually occurring in your own mind. So you wouldn't be able to eliminate them. So here in this particular section of our class, I'll just leave you with mindfulness is all about awareness of mind. But just understand that more detailed, it's the four foundations of mindfulness, which we're going to talk about at the end of today's class. So with mindfulness and this awareness of mind, the Buddha shares that when you see the mind in this sluggish condition, in this lethargic condition, then he teaches to practice the enlightenment factor of investigation, energy, and joy. This is what uplifts the mind. Because in that sluggish condition, you might just be wanting to sit around for hours upon hours, days upon days. You don't feel motivated. You don't feel encouraged. You don't feel like there's any enthusiasm. There's no real uh, initiative to actually do anything. You just feel very lethargic and dull. And the mind doesn't really want to do anything. It just wants to, you know, kind of be dull and lethargic. And the mind's holding on to that. <clears throat> so what the Buddha teaches is to practice this enlightenment factor of investigation, where you have dedicated examination and exploration of his teachings, where you study them deeply and you ask questions to learn the teachings. Because in that dull, lethargic state, the mind wants to just stay there and be dull and lethargic. But you need to arise this enlightenment factor of investigation, where you have this willingness and this interest and this dedication and determination and this diligence to actually investigate the teachings. Because when you're investigating the teachings by coming to classes, by reading books, 
by asking questions, by reaching out to your teacher for personal guidance, by listening to videos and podcasts that I share about these teachings. When you're doing that, then you're gonna find the solutions and the answers to what it is that's plaguing the mind and keeping it in this dull and lethargic state. So when you investigate the teachings, it then arises and springs up this energy where the mind becomes uplifted, where there's this determination and this ambition, this motivation and enthusiasm that comes into the mind as you start encountering the teachings that are gonna help you in life. And that they're not belief, they're not based in belief, instead, you can independently verify these teachings. And then when you're investigating the teachings and this energy starts to spring up and you start seeing these answers to some of the deepest held challenges and problems that you've had throughout your life, then there's this joy that springs up in the mind. Like, wow, I'm getting the answers to things that have plagued me for years and I didn't understand. For years, I didn't understand these things and I was interested in the answers to this. And here it is, this Buddha is explaining to me how I can improve the condition of my mind, improve the condition of my life, my personal and professional relationships can blossom. So there's this joy that comes into the mind, not based on any specific object, but this unconditioned gladness starts to come into the mind, not based on craving, desire, attachment. Then what that's doing is it's bringing the mind to the middle. So it's uplifting the mind out of this sluggish condition to uh, bring it to the middle through investigation, energy, and joy. But as you notice the mind goes to this excited or elated or this thrill and euphoric condition where the mind is shaken up, it's so excited that it's shaken up. Then what you'd like to do is practice the enlightenment factors of tranquility, concentration and equanimity. That's what's gonna bring the mind out of that excited, that thrill, that euphoria. It's gonna bring it into the middle where it can get more used to being in the middle. This tranquility is this relaxed steadiness, the stability, this peacefulness, this stillness of mind. You need to arise that. So with mindfulness, when you observe the mind is in that excited condition, then you arise this tranquility and bring the mind down to this stillness and this peacefulness. And you can then arise the enlightenment factor of concentration, where now you can have this alertness, you can have this attentiveness, this ability to focus the mind on one particular thing. Because oftentimes when the mind is in that excited condition, the mind becomes very anxious. It becomes very stressed because it's bouncing around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. You know, if you've been taught to multitask, that might be what your mind is doing is bouncing around from thing to thing to thing to thing. So the way to get the mind to calm down and come more into the middle is start to focus on just one thing at a time with concentration. So where you observe that the mind is in that excited and euphoric state and it's bouncing around from thing to thing and it makes it very difficult to focus and have concentration, you would like to arise this concentration where you just focus on one thing at a time, having singleness of mind. And then you practice this equanimity, this calmness, this composure, this evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations. You're just kind of putting the brakes on things. You're just kind of easing the mind into this calmness and this composure, even if it's a really difficult situation, because when you're encountering a difficult situation, the mind might either lock up and just completely freeze and not know what to do, or it might go to this rapid cycling where the mind is you know, being bombarded with all these thoughts. And when you allow the mind to do that, then you can't make wise decisions about the difficult situation that you're encountering. So wherever you notice that you're experiencing a difficult situation, the first thing you should be thinking is equanimity, calmness, composure, evenness of temper, bringing the mind into this calmness. Because when the mind is calm, then you can have mindfulness or awareness of mind. Then you can have concentration or focus or clarity of mind. Then you can access wisdom and make wise decisions. But when your mind is uncalm and it's shaken up, 
then you can't have awareness of mind and you can't have concentration or focus and clarity. Then you're going to make unwise decisions because you're not able to access wisdom. And these unwise decisions can make the situation that you're encountering even more problematic and worse. So what the Buddha is teaching you here is part of this entire path to enlightenment is to bring the mind to the middle so it can be calm and composed and then you can access wisdom and make wise decisions because everything that we experience in life is a result of our decisions. And if we allow our mind to go in that excited, lethargic, or excited, uh, euphoric condition, or if we allow it to go into that lethargic and dull condition, then in either situation, the mind isn't performing optimally the way that it was intended to perform. So therefore, the mind's going to be clouded and it's going to lack the ability to make wise decisions and produce wholesome outcomes. So these are tools <clears throat> to help you understand how to bring the mind back to the middle out of that sluggish condition and out of that excited euphoric condition. And it's mindfulness or awareness of mind that is going to allow you to observe the sluggish condition, observe the excited condition, and then bring the mind to the middle based on practicing the collection of the three factors of enlightenment that you need, either investigation, energy, and joy to bring it out of that sluggish condition, or tranquility, concentration, and equanimity to bring it out of that excited condition. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys might have about the seven factors of enlightenment before we move into discussing the five hindrances, because these are really building blocks to help you understand the five hindrances. So you can put those questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. You're mute on, Tony. We uh, can't hear you. I'm sorry, sir. There seems to be no questions at this time. Okay. So let's move on to talking about the five hindrances. We'll talk about the first three first, which is the first one is central desire. This is also one of the fetters that shows up on the fetters. But let me describe to you what central desire is. What central desire is, is where the mind is trying to please itself through the six sense bases. The six sense bases are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the bodily contact, and the mind itself. So the mind is craving agreeable contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact in the mind. The mind wants pleasant feelings. It has this central desire. It craves, it longs, it yearns for agreeable contact. So you want to see only agreeable things, things that you agree with, things that you feel are uh, agreeable. The mind only wants to see certain forms where if it sees those agreeable forms, you get these pleasant feelings. But if you see disagreeable things, then there's these painful feelings that come into the mind, like anger and sadness and frustration. If you see agreeable things, you get those pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement and elation. So the mind is basing its inner feelings on seeing agreeable things because it wants these sensual pleasures. It wants to please the senses. So it wants certain forms to see through the eyes. It wants to hear certain sounds that are agreeable. And when it hears agreeable sounds, it gets pleasant feelings. When it hears disagreeable sounds, it gets the painful feelings. When you smell certain odors that are agreeable, again, pleasant feelings, happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. But then when you smell odors that are disagreeable, then there might be anger or sadness or frustration or irritation or annoyance or some other feeling. And then it's the same thing with the tongue. There are certain flavors that the tongue wants that are agreeable. And then it gets these pleasant feelings. And if it gets disagreeable contact through the tongue, then it experiences these painful feelings. And then the same thing with bodily contact. And then the same thing with the mind. The mind is longing and yearning for certain pleasurable experiences or certain thoughts in the mind. 
So let me give you some examples of this. Let's say you're walking down the street and you see a, a child holding their parent's hand walking down the street. This might be an agreeable thing for you. You see this physical form with the eyes and it's like, oh wow, that's so lovely. Look at the child holding their parent's hand and walking nicely down the street. Oh, this is so lovely. But then you turn the corner and you see another parent who's hitting their child, maybe smacking them across the face. And now that's disagreeable to the eyes. And now you get angry, you get frustrated because you see something that you disagree with. And what's going on here is the mind is craving permanence through the sense bases. It wants permanently agreeable contact. It wants to permanently experience pleasant feelings. But because of the universal truth of impermanence, this is impossible. It can't possibly see permanently agreeable things. It can't possibly experience permanently agreeable sounds through the ears or odors or flavors or bodily contact or certain thoughts in the mind. It can't have that as long as there's central desire there. Because if the mind bases its inner feelings on some thing that it agrees with, then it's only a matter of time before it disagrees with something. So let me give you some more examples. If you have central desire, you might look outside and you might say, oh, it's so sunny outside. This is beautiful. This is lovely. I'm so happy. I'm so thrilled. Let's go outside and have fun. But then you go outside and you start having fun and now it rains and it starts raining. And now because you based your inner feelings of happiness and excitement on sunshine, when you encounter the impermanence of the rain, now the mind is angry or sad or frustrated because of this change. The unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. And when it bases its inner feelings on something like the sun, and I'm happy when it's sunny outside, then when it's raining, that means it's, the mind's going to be sad. So essentially, the mind is setting itself up to fail. It's sabotaging itself. When it immediately, as soon as it starts basing its inner feelings on something like the sun, which is a condition, that condition is not permanent. And now, as soon as you base your inner feelings off of that, then it's only a matter of time before you experience painful feelings because that sun is not permanent. Another, another example, say I'm walking down the street and I feel really joyful, I feel happy, I feel excited because, wow, I'm out by myself, I'm walking down the street, there's all this space and all this room. But now say somebody walks past me and their shoulder bumps into me, boom, wow. Now there's anger, right? Because the mind was basing its happiness or its excitement that I was walking down the street. I had this permanence. I'm so free. I'm able to move about the world. And now it's received this contact by somebody else. And now it doesn't like that impermanence. We're not talking about whether it's right or wrong to bump into people, because obviously we should be aware and not bump into people, right? But the fact is, is that due to the universal truth of impermanence, there's going to be occasions where somebody bumps into us. It's not possible to walk down the street and never have anybody bump into you. It's going to happen. So when it does happen, that's impermanence and the mind might disagree with this. And because of this disagreeable contact, now it experiences these painful feelings. So as long as the mind is having this central desire where it's desiring certain pleasures through the senses, whether it's forms that you see, sounds that you hear, odors that you smell, flavors that you touch, certain physical objects that come in contact with the body or certain mental objects that the mind thinks about. As long as the mind is basing its inner feelings on this contact, then it's only a matter of time before it experiences these pleasant feelings, which are going to be temporary. The happiness, excitement, and elation is temporary. And then when those conditions change, then you're going to experience these painful feelings. So the mind can get caught up in this as it's making its way to enlightenment, that you might get caught up and hold on to something like sexual intercourse. 
you might hold on to that or some flavor like a wine. You might be drinking wine and you just really enjoy that flavor so much you're not willing to let that go in order to train the mind to get to enlightenment. So this is where it can hinder you that as long as you're unaware that the mind is doing this, then you can get uh, caught up into this particular hindrance. Now, when or if you choose to let go of certain central desires, that's your choice. But be aware that there are going to be central desires along the way that the mind is not gonna be willing to let go of. But as I've shared before, related to something like sexual intercourse, somebody can choose to get to that first or second stage of enlightenment and still maintain sexual intercourse. And maybe that's what they choose to do is get to that second stage of enlightenment. They're still having sexual relations. They're doing all the other work on the path to enlightenment, but they're still in a relationship. They're still uh, their partner is still interested in having sex. You're still interested in having sex. And you might continue to do that for a period of time. Who knows how long? But when or if you ever choose to let that go to then move on to future or to uh, further progress on the path, you might choose to have a discussion with your partner. You guys might both be on the path to enlightenment. You guys both might have kind of been there, done that. You've done this enough times that you're ready to let it go. But if you never get to that point, that is what would be a hindrance for you. And it's not just sexual intercourse, it's other sensual desires too, like some of the ones I mentioned, like a certain flavor, or say there's a certain fabric that you just have to have, and you want this fabric to be touching the body, and you feel so wonderful with this fabric on the body. If your mind is attached to that fabric, then it's going to hinder it from getting to enlightenment. It doesn't mean you need to eliminate the fabric. It doesn't mean you need to eliminate the relationship, for example. It means that you need to eliminate the sensual desire where the mind's craving and holding on to these things. And the way that you do that is through eliminating craving, desire, attachment. And the Buddha provides breathing mindfulness meditation as one primary training that we do in order to eliminate the craving desire attachments in the mind. Because what craving desire attachment is, is this mental longing, this strong eagerness, this holding on to things really tightly. So when you're in breathing mindfulness meditation and you're focused on the breath and the mind moves off the breath, you're training the mind to come back and come back and come back. You're not trying to eliminate the thoughts in meditation, although you will get to a period of time where there'll be these long, uh, you know, periods of time in your meditation where the mind will be still and peaceful. But really what you're training is you're training the mind to be able to easily let go of something and come back and come back. Because that's what the mind's going to do as you move about the world. You're going to be walking in the mall and you're going to see a pair of shoes. You're going to be like, oh my goodness, I need that pair of shoes. I want that pair of shoes so bad. But you've got maybe 10 or 20 pairs of shoes at home. What's one more pair of shoes going to do, right? And the mind's going to be longing and yearning for this pair of shoes. And where you spot that and you know that that's what's occurring, you can then cut that off and let it go and come back and realize, you know what? I don't need that pair of shoes right now. I've got 10 or 20 pairs of shoes at home. I will just wear those. And when they are worn out, then maybe I will come and get this pair of shoes. But right now... I don't need that. The mind wants it because of central desire, but it doesn't need it. So breathing mindfulness meditation is training the mind to let go and easily be able to let go so that in meditation, you're training the mind to do that. But then in daily life, you're able to easily do that as well. And generosity is also doing that as well. When you're giving and sharing, this is training the mind to let go. Because when there's central desire, the mind can become very selfish. The mind holds on and it wants everything to be yours and it doesn't want to share. It's not interested in sharing with others. It's holding on and holding on and holding on. So when you practice generosity throughout your days and weeks and months, then what you're doing is you're training the mind to let go. Whether you're holding a door for somebody to let somebody in, whether you're picking up something off the ground that somebody dropped and handed it to them, whether you're sharing a donation with a temple or a teacher or something like that, all of these things and others 
are you training the mind to let go rather than hold on? So breathing, mindfulness, meditation, and generosity are two primary aspects of your practice that you would like to fully develop so that you're training the mind to let go, to let go, to let go. Then you use mindfulness to guard the doorways to discontentedness. The doorways to discontentedness are the six sense bases, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact in the mind. These six sense bases are the doorways that allow discontentedness into the mind. It's craving, desire, attachment, which is the cause of discontentedness. But any discontentedness that you've experienced at any time in your life, not only can you trace it back to a specific cravings, desires, attachments, but it was one of these doorways that it entered into. It was either something you saw, something you heard, something you smelled, something you tasted, some bodily contact, or something that the mind was thinking about that caused the mind to be discontent. And when you can get to the point where you're guarding the doorways, meaning you have mindfulness, you have awareness of the mind, so that when some kind of contact comes through the six sense bases, you can spot it right away that the mind's about to become discontent, and then you can cut it off and let it go. This is someone who's guarding their doorways. You don't need to be fearful. You don't need to be anxious about it, but you'll need to develop mindfulness, like we're going to talk about at the end of class, to the point where you can guard these doorways and you can be aware of agreeable contact and disagreeable contact coming through the doorways. And when you observe that, you know that the mind's going to get these pleasant feelings and you can let that go. And then also you're aware that the mind's going to experience these painful feelings if you allow that to persist in the mind and you can cut that off and let it go. Once you eliminate all cravings, desire, attachments in the mind, there won't be such thing as agreeable and disagreeable contact. The only reason why you have disagreeable or agreeable contact is because there's a certain craving. There's a craving that says, I like these things. I want these things. These things are agreeable to me. Therefore, the opposite of that is disagreeable to me. But when you eliminate craving, desire, attachment, then you can be content, peaceful, and joyful no matter what's happening despite what's happening. So if you go to a restaurant and you're eating a piece of chocolate cake, as an enlightened being, you'll know that it's enjoyable. Wow, this is really enjoyable. This is a deliciously, uh, you know, delicious chocolate cake, but the mind's not gonna cling to it, expecting it to be permanent. We're in the unenlightened state where we don't understand central desire and we don't understand the universal truth of impermanence. We'll be eating that chocolate cake like, oh my goodness, this is the best chocolate cake I've ever had. I can't wait to come back here and get another piece. This is going to be so amazing. I now found this restaurant. I can get this chocolate cake anytime I want. And the next time you come to the restaurant, they have the piece of chocolate cake. Wow, there's these happiness, this excitement, this elation, because you got your chocolate cake. But then on a subsequent occasion, you come to the restaurant and they don't have your chocolate cake. Now there's anger. Now there's sadness. Because the mind allowed the, the craving, desire, attachment to be formed, and now it's clinging to this chocolate cake, it only gets this happiness when it gets the chocolate cake. And now when it doesn't get it, it's going to get these painful feelings. So as an enlightened being, what you need to get to is that when you're tasting something, for example, and you're enjoying it, it's like, wow, I know that this is a really delicious chocolate cake, but it's not permanent. And make sure you know that. Or if you see something or you hear something or you smell something, you taste something, some bodily contact, you need to get to the point where the mind understands that none of these things are permanent. And if you allow the mind to base its inner feelings on these things, it's only a matter of time before the mind gets shaken up with pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or neither painful nor pleasant. So by guarding the doorways, as you're eating that chocolate cake, okay, you're enjoying it, but you're guarding the mind, not allowing those pleasant feelings to arise in the mind. This such happiness, excitement, and elation. 
as you're eating it, you're enjoying it for what it is, but then you know when it's done, it's over and we move on. And then if I come back and there's a piece of chocolate cake there again, okay, wonderful, I'll enjoy some chocolate cake. But if there's no piece of chocolate cake, all right, well, do you have apple pie? No, you don't have apple pie, how about some fruit? No, you don't have fruit? Okay, well, I'll just be fine without dessert. I don't need dessert today, right? And an enlightened mind can be peaceful and joyful regardless. But in the unenlightened state, we don't understand that. We're basing our inner feelings on some contact through these sense bases. And now when we do that, it's only a matter of time before the mind is shaken up. This next one is called ill will. This is also part of the 10 fetters. And these two actually go hand in hand, that when there's central desire in the mind, when there's a craving and longing and yearning for something, then when you get the objects of your affection, you get pleasant feelings. But when you don't get the objects of your affection, that's when the anger, the hatred, the ill will, the hostility, the bitterness, the aggression, the resentment, the frustration, the irritation, the annoyance, all of these things can arise in the mind and now you become very unskillful in your intentions, your speech, and your actions because there was a certain thing that the mind wanted and when it got that, it got pleasant feelings. But if you don't get that, then you get these painful feelings. And typically what the unenlightened mind is going to do is it's going to blame the person or the situation and think that that person or this situation is what's causing your painful feelings. And now that's where that hostility, bitterness, and aggression arises. And now our intention, speech, and actions become unskillful. Whereas if you understand and you take responsibility over your feelings and what you're experiencing, then you know any time the mind becomes angered or hostile or aggressive or a bitter or any of these things, you're causing all of that yourself. It's not the other person. It's not the situation. It's the craving desire attachment. It's the central desire that's causing this ill will to arise. That now when you got the objects of your affection, you were happy. But when you didn't get the objects of your affection, you got this ill will that arose up in the mind. It's essentially like a two or three year old kid throwing a temper tantrum. If you get what you want, you're happy. If you don't get what you want, you throw a temper tantrum, or at least the mind does, right? The mind kind of revolts. It has this aggression and hostility that comes out through our intention, speech, and actions. And sometimes what we do is we have what's called aversion, that because the unenlightened mind misunderstands and it has this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, and it thinks that this person or this situation is what's causing the painful feelings, what the mind thinks is going to solve that is by pushing this person away or by pushing this situation away. And by pushing this person or situation away, the untrained mind, the unwise mind, thinks that that's what's going to solve the problem. That if I can just push this person or this situation out of my way, then that will solve the problem. But that's not what the problem is. The person or the situation isn't the problem. The problem is the craving desire attachment. This is why the anger continues. So even though you push this person or the situation out of your life, this is called aversion. Even though you push that person out, it's only a matter of time before you get angry again about something else. Whereas if this person was the problem, then when you push that person out of your life, your mind would instantly be peaceful, but it's not. When you push that person out of your life, you're not solving the actual problem because the actual problem is the craving in the mind, the central desire, the mental longing and strong eagerness, wanting things your way. So the way that you kind of rewire this in the mind is you practice loving kindness meditation. By practicing loving kindness meditation, you're essentially like filling up the gas tank, training the mind to have a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well and have this active goodwill towards other beings. And when you arise this in the mind through meditation, then you go out into the world and you practice loving kindness through your intention, speech, and actions. 
Because when you're hostile, when you're aggressive, when you're bitter, when you're resentful, when you're irritated, when you're annoyed, and you're allowing that to come through your intention, speech, and actions, then that's what's going to come back to you. Because by you treating other people that way, other people are going to treat you that way. But by you transforming this in the mind and no, lo no longer allowing the ill will to persist, no longer allowing the anger or the hatred to persist, instead transform it with meditation to loving kindness where you have a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. Now you can practice in a way where your intention, speech, and actions are polite, they're kind, they're friendly, and they're respectful no longer being aggressive and hostile to others. So when you're polite, kind, friendly, or respectful to others, then others will gradually be that way with you because that's the way you are with them. But as long as you allow this ill will to persist, then there's going to be unskillful conduct as part of that. And what's important to mention here is that it's not possible for you to hear me share these teachings and then snap your fingers and instantly change. There's going to be situations where you're angry. There's going to be situations where you are unskillful, where you talk in ways that is still bitter and that is still resentful. So what you're doing is you're gradually transforming the mind, aiming to improve and aiming to get better each individual situation. And in situations where you see that you've been unskillful, you can just apologize and let the person know that that you're causing this yourself. You apologize for what you did and you're going to aim to do better if you'd like. You, could, you can share those kind of things because if you allow this anger and hatred and resentment and all these other feelings that come out of ill will to persist, then you're just kind of like going through the forest knocking down trees and burning up the forest. And now you might wonder, why is it so hot? Why does it smell so bad here? Why is my life so difficult? Why am I struggling so much? Well, that's what you're putting out. So when you improve the condition of the mind with loving kindness meditation, and then you practice the way that the Buddha shares as part of the Eightfold Path, through your intentions, your speech, and your actions, and you start infusing these with loving kindness, now the way you interact with people, it's going to be different. And now the way that people choose to interact with you is going to be different. This is the gradual training, the gradual practice, and then gradually you'll experience progress where you'll be able to do this more and more. Because what you're used to is something happens that's disagreeable to you, and the mind goes down this path of anger. And that's what you might have been used to. All of us have been used to that. That's kind of what we might have experienced and kind of grew up with. There's this well-beaten path of anger. And when we experience something we disagree with, we raise our voice, we get hostile, we might yell, we might scream, we get aggressive with our intentions, speech, and actions. And that's the well-worn path that our mind is used to. And that's the easy path right now. But it causes us so much difficulties later in our personal and professional relationships. So what you're doing is you're kind of uh, confronting this with loving kindness meditation and with loving kindness in daily life. It's like getting out a machete and kind of forging a new trail and knocking down all the bushes, knocking down all the stickers, knocking down all the branches and creating this better path over here where now that becomes the well-worn path that when something disagreeable happens, you go to loving kindness, that you understand that this disagreeable thing is going to happen in your life. Because of impermanence, it's not possible for you to agree with everything that happens. So when something disagreeable happens, then you arise this loving kindness. And now this path gets really well worn where the mind is more and more used to going down this path. And this old path of anger gets overgrown. Everything grows back. The the stickers, the bushes, the grass, everything gets overgrown where it's much harder to go down that path. The mind isn't interested in going down that path anymore. It's only interested in going down this new path that you've created because you see the benefits of doing that. You see the benefits of being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to people because that's the way people are with you back. So this new path becomes 
the way that the mind now chooses to function in all situations. But in order to do that, it's gradually developing that through training, practice, and then you'll see the progress. And then the third one that I'll share here before I open up the questions on these three is complacency. This one isn't part of the 10 fetters, but it's part of the five hindrances. Some people refer to this as sloth and toper. If you look in really old books about Buddhism, you might see them use this term of sloth and toper. What complacency is, is the mind has this dullness, this lethargic condition, this lack of motivation. It's not interested in going to classes. It's not interested in reading books. It's not interested in meditating. It's not interested in, you know, doing the work. It just wants to sit around and be complacent. And it's holding on to this complacency. So you've got to get to the point where you are observant of this complacency and you see this dullness, you see this lethargic condition that the mind isn't motivated to meditate, that it isn't motivated to maybe come to class, that it isn't motivated to pick up the book, and you realize that that's complacency, and that's just going to hold you back. It's going to hinder your progress to enlightenment. So what you do is you arise these enlightenment factors of investigation, energy, and joy that I talked about at the very beginning, where you investigate the teachings of the Buddha, which springs up this energy or this motivation, this willingness to do something, and then you experience this joy coming into the mind because the mind's not sitting around feeling dull and lethargic all day. Instead, the mind has been uplifted. So the sooner that you spot this and that you can cut it off and let it go and move the mind in the opposite direction towards the middle, then it's much easier to do that. Whereas if you sit around for one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, it becomes longer and longer period of time that you haven't been meditating, you haven't been reading, you haven't been coming to classes, you haven't been investigating the teachings. It's a lot harder to now redirect the mind and get it moving forward to investigate the teachings and have this energy and this joy spring up in the mind. So the sooner you can catch it, and then redirect the mind towards these enlightenment factors, the more easy it will be for you to then practice the enlightenment factor of investigation, energy, and joy. What I suggest for people is to just read these books about 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. That's it. Just a very short amount of time, just taking a little bite, kind of like you're digesting some food. It's easier to take a small little bite, chew it, and digest it. And if you do that little by little, as you're experiencing certain challenges in life, if you're reading 10 to 20 minutes a day, it's only a matter of time before you come across the teaching where it's like, oh my goodness, three days ago, I was just struggling with that. And here the Buddha is explaining exactly how to fix it, how to resolve it. Or last week I was struggling with that. And here it is. Here's, here's the answer to that. Or if you're reading consistently enough, you'll be reading about certain things. And then like two days from now, you experience that situation and you've already got the answer. You already know what the answer is because you've been investigating the teachings on a continuous, ongoing, consistent basis. So that's really all you need is just to attend some classes, to read for 10, 20 minutes a day, to do some meditation and kind of integrate this into your life and make more and more space in your life so that there isn't this complacency where you're just maybe always on social media or you're playing video games or you're indulging in these central desires because the mind wants to be in that central desire. It doesn't want to do the work to actually move towards enlightenment. It's really kind of holding back. But you need to arise this determination and this diligence and this courage to walk forward and let go of these things that the mind's holding on to. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys might have on these first three. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. Uh, Max uh, has asked me in Zoom, I assume there is not a way of having a sexual relationship without craving, desire, attachment. Right. If there's a sec if there's sexual intercourse in a relationship, there is craving, desire, attachment there. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It's just what the mind does. And the way that you can see that for yourself is that in situations where the mind wants to have sex 
and it gets it, there's these pleasant feelings, right? There's all these pleasant feelings, but they're only temporary. They only last for a certain period of time. In situations where the mind wants sex and it can't get what it wants, which is the sex, it's going to potentially be angry or frustrated or irritated, annoyed. It's going to have those painful feelings because it can't get what it wants. And as long as there's the craving for sexual contact and sexual intercourse, it's going to not be able to have permanent peacefulness, calmness, serenity, and joy, because there's going to be some situations where you can have sex and some situations where you can't. So the mind's going to experience this discontentedness at some point, as long as it continues to have craving for sex. So again, you're not a bad person if you're choosing to have sex. There's no judgment between you know, one person and another. Everybody's on their own independent journey. You, depending on where you are in your practice for everybody, you might have chosen to already give up sexual contact, or maybe you're still choosing to have sexual intercourse. And you might do that for five years, 10 years, 20 years, who knows how long. But whenever you decide, or if you ever decide to let that go, that's your choice, not anyone else's. And we don't judge each other where we are in terms of our practice. But just know that if there is sexual intercourse, there's some craving in the mind that it's not possible to have sexual intercourse without craving desire attachment. The whole reason why the mind wants sex is that it wants those pleasant feelings. And with sex, it's one of the strongest central desires because the eyes are involved, the ears are involved, the nose is involved, the tongue's involved, the bodily contact's involved, and the mind's involved. So all six sense bases are involved. That's why it's so impactful to the mind when someone has sex that it really arises this you know pleasant feelings in the mind for some people, right? So when you no longer base your inner feelings on what's coming through the sense bases and you can get to this peacefulness and this joy with having let that go along with other central desires, then you can get to a permanent peacefulness and a permanent joy. Because without that craving for sex, then you're not going to be discontent when you can't have it. Thank you, sir. Miranda has a question. Um, yes, sir. This, I don't know, it seems kind of so really. Um, about a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago now, I was at uh, 7-Eleven where I typically stop before work to get snacks and some water. Um, I noticed this, it's a flower in like a, a glass thing filled with water and it was a color that I prefer and it had sparkles on it, which I do enjoy the sparkly things. and. It was noticed right away that there was this craving of, oh, look at this, it's so pretty. I should get this, I should buy this. But I know that that is craving due to contact through the eye sense base and chose instead to cut that off and let it go and leave without buying this thing. I guess the question is what I've been doing now is I purposely, I go to the store I'm standing in line and I will look at this object, notice the craving come into the mind less and less each time. And then I know I'm going to leave without purchasing this. Is that learning to guard the doorway of the eye sense base when I know that there's craving for this object that I'm seeing? Or is there something else I should be doing instead of this? Yeah, this is helpful. If you know that there's a certain craving in the mind and you observe that it's arising in a certain situation, you can kind of almost prepare the mind and know that that's what's going to occur. And then as you get farther along in your practice, you can do like what it is that you're talking about, which is actually put the mind in the situation and kind of challenge it and kind of test it to see if it's going to indulge in that craving or if it can turn away and choose to not go forward with that particular craving. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Tracy has a question, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, so the mind struggles a bit to try to find the difference between 
aversion and guarding the doorway to the senses. I think that sometimes I think I'm guarding the doorway to the senses and I'm then it's aversion. Can you help me find the difference? Sure. So what aversion is, is aversion is when you're experiencing some sort of uh, feeling like pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. It's typically painful feelings. And then the mind falsely attributes those painful feelings to some person or some situation. And then it tries to push that person or situation out of your life, thinking that that's going to solve the problem. That's what aversion is, that where you think that this person or this situation is what's causing these painful feelings, and I'm going to push that out of my life, and that solves the problem. So that's aversion. What guarding the doorways would be is if you're walking down the street and you know that there's a certain neighbor, for example, that uh, is really hostile or really aggressive, and you're not interested in going around that person, you can choose to go down another street and not because the mind thinks that by seeing this person, you're going to get angry and that person's causing it, but you're just making a wise choice that it's better for me to go down this street because if I go down that street, this person's going to be hostile and aggressive and might come out of the house. And I'm just not interested in being involved in that. And I'm going to go down this other street where in that situation, you still understand that if there's any anger or frustration that arises, you're causing it yourself, but you're just making a wise choice to not go past this particular neighbor's house. Does that make sense? It does, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Tonka has a question. I would like to clarify something in the example of abuse of a child. Like, uh, it's very hard for me to imagine that situation without not having any emotional reaction. Like, obviously, uh, it's not recommended to get angry or excited about that. But just the very scene of something like that uh, would cause emotional reaction in my case, but uh, I don't know if you are saying that uh, we can have compassion without emotion, uh, emotions inside of our body, or if you could clarify on that, because it's not very clear to me how compassion goes together without not having any emotion when witnessing something like abuse. Sure. So if the mind has craving to have things in the world happen a certain way, when things are happening that way, there's going to be pleasant feelings. But when things aren't happening that way, then there's going to be painful feelings. So using this example, if you would like to see all kids be uh, safe in the world, if you have that interest, if you have the goal, if you have that objective, all right, wonderful. We would like to see all kids be safe. I would like to see all kids be safe. But when you crave it and you desire it and you long for it, that's when you're going to be discontent because it's not possible for all kids to be safe. We're not letting people off the hook and saying that, oh, okay, well, let's just abuse kids then. That's not what we're saying. What I'm helping you to see is that why is your mind discontent when you see this child get slapped by its parent? Why is the mind discontent in that situation? Well, it's because you're craving for all kids to be safe. And that's a certain mental longing and strong eagerness. As long as that exists in the mind, when you see a child get slapped, for example, you're going to experience painful feelings. So what you're training the mind to do is understand that you can't permanently have things your way. It's not possible. So as long as you're craving for things to permanently be your way, when they're not that way, that's when the mind's going to be discontent. So what you need to do is, yes, transform the mind to have compassion where you have concern for the misfortune of this child, but realize that you're not the one who caused this situation to occur, right? What you choose to do about it or not do about it is up to you. You know, the Buddha doesn't say, 
you know, whenever you see somebody get slapped, go fix that, right? That's not what his teachings are about. His teachings are helping you understand why your mind is discontent in that situation. So you can get to a point where when something like this occurs, your mind is not shaken up by it. Your mind is not discontent because of it. Right now, if there's a craving in the mind, it sounds like, yes, your mind's going to be shaken up as a result of perhaps seeing a child get smacked. But you can get to the point where you understand that this is just the parents craving desire attachment. This is their anger. This is their unknowing of true reality. That's what they're choosing to do. That's their life. That's their relationship. I'm not in that life. I'm not in that relationship. I didn't choose for that to happen. I have concern for the misfortune of this child, just like I have concern for the misfortune of the parent too in that situation. But it's not my role to go around and fix everybody else. I can't fix that parent. That parent has to choose to fix themselves. So as long as my mind would be craving for the parent to function a certain way, when they're not functioning that way, you're going to experience painful feelings. And it doesn't mean if you're calm and peaceful in that situation, it doesn't mean you don't care. Because oftentimes what we associate with care is that if I get angry or sad at this, that means I care. But the care isn't what's causing the anger and sadness. It's the craving, desire, attachment that's causing it. And you have to be able to see this for yourself and see true reality because the mind thinks very differently in the unenlightened state where it thinks that when the situation like that occurs and there's anger and sadness, oh, that's because I care. And now because I care, I'm going to go over here and try to solve this. And I'm going to go talk to this parent. And now the parent pulls out a gun and shoots you. And now you're dead, right? Because of the unwise decision of what's happened. So the mind has to understand that any emotion that you're feeling in that situation is being caused by the craving, desire, attachment. And you can get to the point where you don't have that strong feeling of anger, or sadness, or frustration in a situation where there's something happening that you would prefer not to happen. I think uh, what, uh, what I'm not understanding is, I understand that strong feeling is craving and desire. Strong feeling, but just a sense this is not right. I thought that our emotions would point us what's right, what's wrong. Just just having a inside a feeling, this is just not right. Like it's understood, strong feelings are uh, attachment. But just that sense when we see something, this is not right. That's what I'm questioning. Are we supposed to have any of that or none of it? As long as you're thinking in terms of this is right and this is wrong, this is the ego trying to determine what's right and wrong for other people. You've got to let go of that and realize that what you choose to do is what you choose to do. What other people choose to do is what they choose to do. And you can't control what other people choose to do. If you see a parent hit a child and you think this is wrong, now your mind is judging them. And this is your own conceit and your own ego in judging that person. Instead, you might think that this is unfortunate. I've actually been in this exact situation when I was traveling this summer. I was at a place where a father just literally smacked this child across the face. I didn't see it, but I heard it. It was extremely loud. My back was to the person and I looked to the people around me because we were kind of in a circle. And I said, did what I think happened just happened. Did somebody just smack their child extremely hard? And everybody's eyes looked at me and were like, yep, that's exactly what happened. And I thought, hmm, that's unfortunate. I didn't think that's right or that's wrong. I just thought, hmm, that's unfortunate, right? So in that situation, the mind could remain peaceful and calm and steady, even though I wouldn't do that same thing to my child this person chose to do that to their child. And I'm not going to judge them whether they're right or wrong, but I just know that that's a situation that doesn't involve me. And now I'm in the situation where I'm choosing to make decisions about my life. 
Now, if I was in a situation, depending on where it was and what's going on, where somebody was being repeatedly abused in front of me, I might choose to step in and, and try to help the person. But in this situation where it was a father hitting a, a son across the face that was eight years old, I mean, a literally whack. I mean, it really echoed in the environment that we were in. You know, in that situation, it's unfortunate that this child is experiencing that. But this is what craving anger and ignorance produces. As long as there's a lack of wisdom, a lack of moral conduct, and a lack of mental discipline in that parent's mind, that child is going to continue to experience that. And I guarantee that wasn't the first time that that child experienced that. So me stepping in in that situation isn't going to solve anything because the problem is in the parent's mind. The craving, anger, and ignorance is what's the problem in the parent's mind. The lack of wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline is the problem. And I can't fix that for that person. That person has to choose to resolve that and eliminate that. So you can get to the point where this doesn't shake up your mind and you just understand what is occurring and you understand that you can't solve it. So there's no reason for you to step in in that situation because it's just going to make the matter worse. I can respect every adult's free will and their decision uh, 100%. But I just feel us as adults, um, like if we see abuse of children, I feel uh, that we are responsible you know, even if it's not our child, like it's a child, they can't protect themselves. And I feel a little bit different in uh, in uh, situations when children are involved. Yeah, so there might be situations where I might say something or I might step in and there might be situations where I don't step in and I don't say anything. So in this situation where it was one slap and then it was over with, with, you know, what am I going to do? Go over there and say, sir, you shouldn't hit your child okay, who am I, right? Who am I to tell this person what to do with their child? And why would I even be disillusioned to think that this adult would even listen to me and heave my advice, right? So this is the arrogance, the ego wanting to go in. And this is the craving, wanting to go in and fix things in the world when you can't fix that. Now, if this was somebody that was being repeatedly abused in front of me, of course, you know, we would like to stop that harm from happening. I probably would have stepped in and done something, but not with craving, because as long as there's craving involved, the mind's going to be uncalm, it's going to be shaken up, and it's going to make unwise decisions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that, Tonka, is that an enlightened being isn't going to be going around trying to fix the world because they realize that they can't fix the world. Each individual person has to choose to improve their own mind and their own decision-making. They have to choose to eliminate these pollutions in their mind. You can't force somebody to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, there's a question in the The Pico asks, is masturbation a sexual, sexual misconduct? It's not part of sexual misconduct, but it is a central desire. So when you look at the Buddha's teachings on the, the third precept, he's very clear about what sexual misconduct is, and it's all related to causing harm through your conduct to other people. So when you're masturbating, there's only one person involved. You're not causing any harm to others but it does uh, degrade your own mind over a period of time. But if you look in chapter, if you look in volume one, chapter seven, I talk about masturbation in there related to the third precept because it's not that it's all good. It's not that it's all bad necessarily. It's not that it's all wholesome or all unwholesome. There's a way to potentially use masturbation to reduce sensual desire, but the mind can get attached to it as well. So it's important that you understand it in its totality, um, but it's not part of sexual misconduct. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I see your lips moving, Tony, but I can't hear you. I don't see any questions at this time, sir, Okay, so let's move on to the next three. 
or I'm sorry, the next two, which is restlessness and worry and doubt. What restlessness and worry is, is this is where the mind is anxious and uh, it's kind of stressed, it's worried, it's confused, distracted. It's this restless state of mind. And oftentimes what you'll see is you'll see your body, that your leg might be bouncing, your knee might be bouncing, you might be tapping things repetitively because the mind is so busy and it's restless that it's coming out through the body because the mind is the boss and the body's the employee. The body's just following whatever's going on in the mind. So if the mind is restless, if it's overactive, if it's anxious, then this anxious energy is gonna come out through the body and you'll see this repetitive tapping with the finger or the bobbing of the knee and things like this. And when this is going on in the mind, the mind's gonna be confused, it's gonna be distracted. It's not gonna be able to focus on just one thing at a time. So this is what restlessness is. And the worry part is where the mind is worried about your own unskillful conduct or your own unwholesome and unwise decisions. This is a hindrance to your enlightenment because there's a certain amount of things that we've all done in the past that were unwise and unwholesome. We've all done all those things. If the mind is worried about those things, then it's going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. And as you learn these teachings and you realize that you can't snap your fingers and implement them immediately, if you worry about your unwise decisions that you were making, then it's going to hinder you in your enlightenment. What you need to get to is get to the point where the mind can experience this enlightenment factor of tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, where you can have this calmness and this composure. And there, when you're making unwise decisions, now that you know the wise decisions through the Buddhist teachings, that you understand and you're like, okay, well, I'm still working on this. I'm still uh, evolving. I'm still growing. I'm a work in progress. It's not possible for you to snap your fingers and immediately resolve everything that you've been struggling with for all these years. So where you look back over your life and you realize that you've really struggled and have difficulties in your life, you've got to let yourself uh, feel a reprieve from that. And realize that at that time, you lacked wisdom, you lacked moral conduct, and you lacked mental discipline because you didn't understand the wisdom of these teachings. And it makes sense that somebody who lacks wisdom is going to do the things that we've all done in the past. So those things are in the past. You can't change them. You can't go back and fix them. They're in the past. Now in the present moment, you've learned this wisdom of the Buddha's teachings. Now you can gradually start working on improving your decisions. But even as you go forward, you're going to have missteps. You're not going to be able to implement these teachings perfectly as soon as you've learned them as part of this program. So you're going to make unwise decisions. There's going to be more unwholesome results because of that. But each time you see that occurring, you just aim to do better and you aim to do better and you aim to do better. You can allow the mind to be calm in that situation that even when you see that you've made a mistake <clears throat> or you've made an unwise decision, just investigate that, observe that, allow the mind to learn from that. If you need to reach out to your teacher or another member of the community in order to get help and understand how to resolve that, then that's what you do. Be sure that you get the wisdom that you need because what the unenlightened mind it tends to do is when it faces a certain struggle or it faces a certain difficulty or challenge, it wants to run away from it. And it thinks that that's going to solve the problem. But then that same problem keeps reoccurring over and over and over and over again because you've run away from the problem. You haven't cultivated the wisdom that you need in order to overcome that obstacle. If you keep running away from the struggles and the challenges that you experience in life, you're just resorting yourself to a continuous cycle of these problems continuing over and over and over again. The reason why you're struggling and having difficulties in certain situations is just because you lack wisdom. You lack the wisdom of how to overcome that obstacle. And if you keep running away from that obstacle, then you're going to keep having the problem. You're going to keep having the, the struggle over and over and over again. So what you need to do is turn around and walk towards the struggle, even though it might be painful, even though it's difficult, even though it's a real challenge, walk towards that struggle. 
consult with the learning materials, consult with your teacher, consult with other members of the community, and try to cultivate the wisdom of how to overcome that challenge so then it won't get repeated over and over. The reason why you're experiencing that is because of the lack of wisdom. So the only way to overcome it is to cultivate the wisdom that you need. So while you're confronting that situation and you're in that situation, be sure to confront it and make sure you cultivate all the wisdom you need so that then you're more able to overcome that challenge. And in order to do that, you're gonna to need to have this tranquility, this concentration, this equanimity, this calmness and this composure, this relaxed mind, this ability to focus with singleness of mind. Because when the mind's worried and anxious, it's gonna be bombarded with this anxiety. It's gonna go up into this escalated, elevated, mental state. But what you're trying to do is you're interested in calming the mind down with that tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, and then just focusing on one thing at a time rather than trying to do so many different things at one time. So restlessness and worry, if the mind is bombarded with all these various thoughts, it's going to hinder you from being able to get to this peacefulness and this calmness. Right? And connecting this back to what we were just talking about with children and things, if the mind's worried that people in the world are struggling and having difficulties, then it's going to hinder you from stepping forward. If the mind's craving for the world to be a certain way and your mind isn't able to move forward, then you're being stuck in the world. It doesn't mean you don't care by choosing to move forward. It just is a recognition that you can't solve the problems of 7.5 billion people in the world. And if we thought that we could, then this would be our arrogance, this would be our conceit, looking down on others and thinking that what others are doing is wrong and what we're doing is right. Instead, it's important to realize this is an independent journey and you're on this independent journey and where people are interested in uh, having advice from you or having thoughts from you or seeking your understanding or how you might particularly handle a situation, then share that with them. But when we interject ourselves into other people's lives, thinking that we know better than them, that's our ego. And that's where the mind can be restless and worried about what's going on in the world. And it will hinder us from being able to experience the liberation and freedom of strong feelings because it's holding on to the world so tightly. The fifth one here is doubt. What doubt is, is this is part of the 10 fetters, by the way, which restlessness is part of the 10 fetters as well. Doubt is doubt about the Buddha, the teachings, the community that you're part of, your teacher, and your own ability to attain enlightenment. If you have doubt about any of these things, it's going to hinder you from being able to fully become determined and dedicated with diligence to move forward on this path. But the way that you eliminate doubt is not through blindness or through belief or through faith. That's not how you eliminate doubt. The way that you eliminate this doubt about the Buddha, his teachings, the community, your teacher, and your own ability to attain enlightenment is you arise the enlightenment factor of investigation by learning, reflecting, and practicing the teachings to acquire wisdom through your own independent verification of the teachings. Then as you see the improvement to the condition of your mind where the discontentedness gradually diminishes, then you will build this confidence that you know what it felt like to feel angry and frustrated in the past. And when you observe that that's gradually diminishing to the point where it's completely eliminated. This helps you to overcome any doubts and you have this confidence that you understand that this person who we refer to as the Buddha or Gautama Buddha, he was surely a Buddha because here we are 2,500 years later and if you're learning his teachings, you're independently verifying them and you're practicing them and seeing that they're the truth and actually working to improve the condition of your mind, then you know that surely he was a Buddha and you gain this confidence in him, in his teachings, that you see that his teachings are indeed being impactful and in helping you in your life. 
And then this community that you're part of, if you see that people are encouraging and supporting and motivating and interested in seeing you do well, then you start building this, com this confidence in the community, particularly if people, if you have reached out to people and they've helped you with certain challenges that you're experiencing. And then if you observe that the condition of your mind is gradually improving and coming more and more into this peacefulness and joy, then you eliminate the doubt about your teacher and the person who's helping you and guiding you to understand the teachings. You start realizing like, wow, this person must really know the teachings because as I've learned from them and as I've implemented their teachings, I've been able to independently verify them. And as I practice them, I see the condition of my mind improving. So then you start having confidence in your teacher and you start having confidence in your own ability to attain enlightenment because you've seen a certain amount of progress. And where you see that progress, you start building this confidence in your own ability to attain enlightenment. This is what eliminates doubt not blind belief or faith or anything like that, but by investigating the teachings, by learning, reflecting, and practicing, as you see the improvements to the condition of your mind, that's where you observe that there is progress and you get to the point where you have absolutely no doubt that these teachings are indeed leading you to an improved condition of mind and an improved life. So these are the five hindrances that the Buddha describes, but there's other hindrances as well that he talks about in more detail in other parts of his teachings. But there's really one hindrance, which is the biggest hindrance of all hindrances. This is called ignorance or unknowing of true reality. We translate this word that was used during the lifetime of the Buddha to ignorance, and today, the word ignorance is kind of a derogatory term. Oftentimes, people look down on others and say that this person is ignorant. That's not the way that the Buddha used this word. Instead, it's more described as the unknowing of true reality. Essentially, the unenlightened mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. And because it doesn't understand the natural laws of existence, it struggles and it has difficulties in the world. So the unenlightened mind doesn't understand that it's causing its own anger, that it's causing its own frustration, that it's causing all of these discontent feelings in others itself because of craving, desire, attachment. So there's all these things with relationship to the natural laws of existence that the unenlightened mind doesn't understand. It doesn't understand the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path. It doesn't understand the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect, that if you are polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, that is what will come back to you. If you are aggressive, hostile, and bitter, that's what's gonna come back to you because that's what you're putting out. So there's so many things that the unenlightened mind doesn't understand, and it's used to functioning in a certain way in the past. And the mind is holding on to functioning this way. And it holds on to its opinions and its views, and it doesn't want to let those go in order to liberate the mind to learn something new. It's lacking wisdom, or it has this ignorance or unknowing of true reality. This is the hindrance of all hindrances. As we talked in this program, it's craving, desire, attachment that is causing discontentedness, and that is what arises anger. But the whole reason why craving exists is because of ignorance, because of the unknowing of true reality. That's the reason why craving exists. So while we call it craving, anger, and ignorance, it's actually ignorance is be leading to craving. And because of craving, the mind becomes angered. And you can see the truth on this the more you investigate the teachings. So while we just talked about these five hindrances, and these are indeed hindrances that will hinder you from getting to enlightenment, you should always keep in mind that it's ignorance or the unknowing of true reality that is the hindrance above all hindrances. So in situations where you're learning these teachings or you're having conversations with people, you should just always assume that the mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand and ask questions to understand more. Because of the ego in the mind, it wants to believe, it wants to think that we know best. 
because the ego has this arrogance and this conceit and this pride and this measuring and comparing. So it thinks that it knows best. Instead, if you understand that this ignorance or this lack of wisdom, this unknowing of true reality is always in the mind until the mind is enlightened, then when you're in a situation where you don't understand something, you should ask questions and try to understand rather than try to convince other people that what we know is the truth. As long as we're continually trying to convince others that what we know is the truth, then they're still craving in the mind. As long as we're projecting our own opinions and our own views onto other people, then that ego is in there, that craving is in there, trying to convince other people that we know the truth. Instead, an enlightened being understands that they're on their own journey. We have nothing to prove to anybody. You don't have anything to prove to anybody. You're on this journey in life on your own. And as long as you keep being interested in proving to others that you know the truth and you're trying to prove something to somebody, this is just the craving of the mind wanting to project itself in a certain way. So this is the five hindrances. I'll just pause here before we talk about mindfulness and see what questions you guys might have on these two hindrances. Thank you, sir. Yes, Tonka has a question in, in uh, Zoom. Teacher David, I would just like to clarify about the words right or wrong, because um, uh, when we talked about it, you said as soon as we think in that way, right or wrong, it's our ego speaking. But then, uh, uh, eightfold part is uh, referring to right view, right uh, intention, right effort. So I, I'm just a little bit confused with the words uh, right and wrong. Like, because uh, is it something that we should use or we can use them in different contexts? I just got a little bit confused with the, with the word right because I hear it. Uh, I heard you a few times saying you just do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. yes. but, then, uh, but then in this mm -hmm. case, if we look at things as right or wrong, you mentioned it's coming from the ego. So if you can just explain that, please. Sure. So when you see right view and right intention on the AFOL path, what this refers to is righteous, meaning this is a proper view. This is the way to understand the natural law of gamma and the way to function in the world. It's not determining that this is right or this is wrong. Even though the Buddha uses those words of right view versus wrong view, it's not declaring that these things are right and wrong for other people. Right. When you think of when you see a parent hit a child, since that's the example that we've been talking about, and you think this is right or this is wrong, that's judging the other person of that's right or wrong. But when you're studying certain teachings and the Buddha is explaining to you, this is the natural law of gamma and this is the righteous way to understand with wisdom what is going to lead to wholesome results for you. That's not judging another person as being right or wrong it's helping you to understand what is the proper understanding of the natural law of gamma okay it's just understanding the language how it's being used because the same word is being used in two different uh, uh, ways okay thank you it's not about how the words used tonka it's about the way the mind thinks Whereas if the mind thinks that this person is right and that person is wrong, this is the mind's conceit. This is the ego. This is the arrogance. This is the judging of another person. But when you understand you're studying something to understand the proper way of practice for yourself, now you're thinking of this is what I'm doing for my practice and this is helpful and beneficial for me. But I'm not going to judge other people that they're right or wrong based on what they're doing. What about case uh, um, like if it's concerning myself, like um, I can judge myself as well, can't I? Like if you put yourself above or below others, this is a judgment, right? But if you're pract if you're practicing discernment 
where you're making wise decisions about what you feel is best for your life, that's not a judgment of you. You're just choosing that I would prefer to do this. Like, for example, I prefer not to hit my son. I prefer not to yell at him. I prefer to, to talk with him and guide him and have discussions with him. And that's what I prefer. And that's what works best for me. But if somebody else chooses something differently, that's their choice. I'm not going to think that this person is right or wrong. It's just what they're choosing to do for their life. And I'm choosing to do what I do for my life. So you can have certain decisions that you feel are beneficial for your life without considering it to be right or wrong. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Brenda has a question. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, Teacher David, at the bottom of this page on the slide, it says there are other hindrances as well. What are some of those other hindrances, sir? Well, the main one that I talk about here is I talk about the hindrance of ignorance, right? Because that's the, the, that's the hindrance of all hindrances. But then I've seen discourses of the Buddha where he talks about 16 hindrances and 32 hindrances, and he expands it more and more. I don't have those remembered and can recall those, but these are the five main hindrances. And then, of course, the, the, the 10 fetters as well. But I haven't had a need to dive into those others that are there. But these here will provide you what you need in order to overcome uh, all the obstacles that I've encountered along this journey and along this path. I haven't had a need to dive into those other ones. Okay. So if there was curiosity in mind, that would be something that could be looked into independently, but it doesn't seem to be as up there on the like ladder of importance as these five okay right Thank you, sir. i would encourage you guys to study these five and understand these because these are the major hindrances and then as we're talking and you're seeking personal guidance if there's a need to look at the other ones you can surely do that but i haven't seen any need for my own practice or for the students that i guide okay thank you sir mm -hmm. you're welcome Yes, sir, there doesn't seem to be any more questions at this time. All right, so let's talk about the four foundations of mindfulness because it's mindfulness that is going to uh, be there to support you in identifying these five hindrances. And it also supports you in other parts of your practice too. You wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without mindfulness. And it's called right mindfulness in the Eightfold Path. But remember, this refers to righteous mind mindfulness, the proper way to practice mindfulness for yourself. And this right mindfulness is to uh, essentially have awareness of mind. This is the way that I teach it at the very beginning for students who are just starting to learn is I teach to have awareness of mind. This is a general way for somebody who's just starting out on the path to just think about having awareness of mind because if you're working to purify the mind, you would need to have awareness of what's in the mind, either wholesome or unwholesome, in order to be able to purify it. You would need to identify wholesome qualities and support that, encourage that, don't allow it to fade. And you would need to be able to identify the unwholesome qualities and then cut those off and let them go and eliminate them from the mind. So with mindfulness or awareness of mind, this is what's helping you kind of observe the mind and observe what needs to be eliminated and what needs to be cultivated in order to move the mind closer and closer to enlightenment. But then once you understand awareness of mind and you're starting to cultivate this through meditation, through breathing, through breathing mindfulness meditation, and then through practicing mindfulness in daily life, then you start understanding the four foundations of mindfulness in order to now understand each one of these in more detail and then practice them in daily life. What the Buddha describes in the step of the Eightfold Path called right mindfulness is he describes this body as body, feelings as feelings, mind as mind, and mental objects as mental objects. And if you read the Eightfold Path of where he's explaining this, which is in Volume 1, Chapter 5, you'll see where he's explaining right mindfulness. 
<clears throat> and what he's explaining there in the four foundations of mindfulness is to have awareness of the bodily sensations and have awareness of the feelings that are in the mind and have awareness of the condition of the mind and have awareness of the mental objects. The way that he describes this is he's essentially laying out for you the process that the mind goes through and what you're going to experience when there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind. <clears throat> he's explaining what you're going to experience as this discontentedness is arising. <clears throat> because of craving, desire, attachment in the mind, when you encounter something that's agreeable, there's going to be certain pleasant feelings that are going to start to arise. But first, you're going to experience bodily sensations. You're going to experience some sensations in the body. And that's unique to each individual person. You might feel tingling in the body with pleasant feelings. You might feel this kind of rush of energy in the mind as these pleasant feelings are coming over the mind. But there's going to be some pleasant feelings that are producing uh, I'm sorry, there's going to be some craving that is producing these bodily sensations to occur. And then the same thing with painful feelings. Before the feelings become feelings in the mind, like anger and sadness and frustration in others, there's going to be some bodily sensation that precedes that. If you have anger, you might experience prior to the mind becoming angry, you might feel certain sharp sharpness coming up through the feet and the legs and the stomach and the torso. You might feel heat maybe rising up through the body. You might feel pressure in the head uh, like it's expanding. Each person is going to experience something differently. If you're not currently aware of these bodily sensations, what you're learning as part of right mindfulness is that you need to become aware of them. Because in order for you to eliminate discontent feelings, you're going to need to be able to observe it as bodily sensations and be able to cut it off and let it go there. If you're not able to observe the bodily sensations now, it's okay, but you'll need to build up your practice more and more that you observe these bodily sensations that are occurring before a feeling comes into the mind. So let me take an example that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with is if you've ever been shy, somebody might say, oh, you've got butterflies in your stomach. Well, what we're describing is we're describing the queasiness in the stomach. That's the bodily sensation that is occurring before the shyness arises. So what you're working to do is be so observant of these bodily sensations that you can catch any discontentedness that is about to arise and cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation. Because if you miss it as a bodily sensation, then it's going to become a feeling in the mind. So now there's this thrill, this euphoria, or this anger, or this sadness, or this boredom, or this loneliness in the mind. So now it's become a feeling because we missed it as a bodily sensation. And now as a feeling, we can cut it off and let it go there. And sometimes you can. But if you don't cut it off and let it go as a feeling, then it's going to affect the condition of the mind for multiple hours or for multiple days, maybe even a week or so. You might have been angry over something. This is because you didn't catch it as a bodily sensation. You didn't catch it as a feeling. And now that feeling has affected the condition of the mind where for multiple hours, days, or weeks, you experienced the anger in the mind. And then it's feeding this mental object of ill will, for example, in this example. So this is kind of the life cycle that discontentedness goes through as it's arising due to craving desire attachment. It's craving desire attachment that is producing something like anger. But there's going to be first these bodily sensations, next the feelings, next the condition of the mind is going to be affected, and it's going to feed this mental object. And what the Buddha is teaching you as part of his teachings is to apply right effort, to cut off and let go of any arising discontentedness at the bodily sensations. And that requires practice to learn how to do that and cut it off at the bodily sensations so that it's not polluting the mind with feelings or affecting the condition of the mind or feeding this mental object. So if you get better and better at observing the bodily sensations that are occurring, 
prior to discontentedness arising, then you can kind of block it and cut it off there. All the while, you're saving yourself of having to experience the feelings of discontentedness or the condition of the mind being affected. And then all the while, you're working on breaking up this mental object of something like ill will or central desire or something else. So it's loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness, which is like the jackhammer that's breaking up this mental object of ill will. And while you're working on doing that with loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in daily life, if you can get more and more aware of these bodily sensations and you can cut them off and let them go there, then you're not feeding this mental object of ill will. And this is how you get ahead of the curve on solving this problem of anger arising in the mind. The way that you can think about this is that if you were going to take a boat ride from the USA to England or from Australia to Japan or from Australia to Indonesia or something like this, if you're in, out in the middle of the ocean in this boat, you're interested in preventing the water from ever coming into this boat. Because if this water comes into the boat, you've got a real problem to deal with. So you're going to do everything you can to prevent this water from ever coming into this boat. And that's what you're trying to do with cutting off and letting go of any arising discontentedness at the bodily sensations, that you're trying to prevent those discontent feelings from ever coming into the mind and becoming feelings. But even if it becomes feelings, you can cut it off there. So if the water comes into the boat, you can scoop the water out of the boat and patch the boat, and then you've solved the problem. But it's going to keep potentially coming in and penetrating through that patch. So you would like to get way ahead of the curve and be observant of these bodily sensations and cut off and let go of any discontentedness there so that you're no longer feeding this mental object of ill will. The way that all this really gets started is that when we were infants and we were babies, we didn't come out of our mom's stomach with ill will. <clears throat> we weren't in the nursery at the hospital looking at other babies, wishing harm and, and, and having anger and resentment and uh, jealousy about the other babies. These mental objects were formed over time. So when we come out of our mother's womb, we don't have ill will. But because of our cravings of wanting things to be a certain way, as we aged, there were certain things that we experienced that were pleasurable and we got the objects of our affection. And then there were certain things that we were craving that we didn't experience and we got angry and we got hostile and we got bitter. And there were bodily sensations. There were feelings that came into the mind. It affected the condition of our mind long term, and then it fed this mental object and created this mental object of ill will. And now that ill will got more and more deeply rooted in the mind, where now it's much easier for that to arise now that the mind has been conditioned and it formed this mental object of ill will. So what you're looking to do is now that this process has taken place and it's formed these mental objects of something like ill will, and by the way, all of these hindrances are mental objects. What you're choosing to do is become aware of the bodily sensations, cut it off, let it go there. Meanwhile, work on breaking up this mental object of central desire, of ill will, of complacency, of restlessness and worry, of doubt. And you're breaking this up with the solutions that the Buddha provided you. But wherever you observe discontentedness arising, if you can catch it as a bodily sensation, that's the best. But if it becomes a feeling, still work to cut it off there. And if you don't cut it off there, if it be, starts affecting the condition of the mind, still cut it off there too. Oftentimes, one of the best ways to cut off and let go of this arising discontentedness is to just redirect the mind is direct the mind towards something else. So if you're sitting in your living room and you're sitting on the sofa and the mind's starting to get bored and lonely, and with mindfulness, you're aware that there's these bodily sensations that are starting to occur, rather than just sit there and do nothing and be complacent and allow that to occur, you might choose to get up off the sofa and go get a book or go outside for a walk or you know, go for a drive or something like that. That's how you redirect the mind towards something else and not allow that 
bodily sensation to now penetrate into the mind and become a feeling of boredom so that you redirect the mind and you no longer allow the mind to experience that feeling. And then more and more, the mind comes into this middle, like grinding that steel on the wood, and it gets used to not experiencing boredom. Whereas if you allow anger or boredom or all these other discontent feelings to come into the mind, then it gets used to feeling these feelings and it doesn't know what to do with them. Whereas if you can catch it as a bodily sensation and redirect the mind somewhere else, then you're rewiring the mind to no longer experience these discontent feelings. But that requires mindfulness or awareness of mind. And specifically, awareness of the bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind and the mental objects. So again, you shouldn't believe what I'm sharing with you here. This is the teachings on the four foundations of mindfulness and explaining the life cycle of discontentedness. You should be able to look at situations in your past or situations that you're going to experience going forward, and you should be able to see each one of these four foundations. You should be able to get more and more observant of the bodily sensations. I know you've experienced these feelings. I know you've experienced the condition of the mind and you can start observing these mental objects that the Buddha is pointing out to you as part of the 10 fetters, as part of the five hindrances, and as part of other parts of his teachings, you can see these mental objects and then start breaking them up and disintegrating them, obliterating them, destroying them as the Buddha taught with his certain teachings. And then all the while, you're no longer allowing those mental objects to get fed because you're blocking it at the bodily sensations. And this is how you get ahead of the curve on the mind experiencing discontentedness. The Buddha shared that when somebody is aware of the bodily sensations and they can cut it off and let it go there, this person is close to enlightenment because you've cultivated the training that you need to be aware of the bodily sensations and you can cut it off and let it go there. So if you've developed the mind to this point or you get to the point where you have developed that, the Buddha is saying this person is very close to enlightenment because you've developed the mind and cultivated it to such a point that you're aware of the bodily sensations when they occur and you can cut it off and let it go there. Because it's usually only a matter of a split second or a couple of seconds that you experience those bodily sensations before the feeling comes into the mind. So you have a very short period of time there to be able to cut it off and let it go. But just as I said, you're not going to be able to do this immediately just because you've heard me explain this now. You're not going to be able to go off and be an expert at this immediately. It's going to take you meditation. It's going to take you continuous training and practice in your daily life to be able to build up to the point where you can do these things. So let me stop here because this is everything that I had to share with you guys for today's class and see what questions you guys might have. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. I'm wondering what the body bodily sensations, is that with all bodily sensations or are there healthy body bodily sensations and that you've got to be able to distinguish? It, it would be wise for you to be able to distinguish them, right? Because if you're having a bodily sensation, like say you're sitting in a certain way and your knee is painful because the circulation is being inhibited and your joint doesn't feel good, that's not a bodily sensation related to discontentedness arising. That's a bodily sensation because the body's in a position that is uncomfortable and then you need to take action to be able to resolve it. There's other bodily sensations that are occurring outside of these type of bodily sensations that are associated with craving, desire, attachment, and discontentedness that is arising. So you'll need to get to the point where you can be aware of those and then distinguish them and then be able to skillfully work with them so that then you'll be able to take action to cut, the, cut it off and let it go as just a bodily sensation. Okay. Are there healthy body weight sensations? Are there, uh, because they your feeling and so on? What do you mean by a healthy bodily sensation? Like healthy for the mind or healthy for the physical body? 
uh, healthy for uh, the foundations of mindfulness. Oh, I see. So the four foundations of mindfulness are specifically talking about the arising of discontentedness. And there isn't going to be any bodily sensations associated with discontentedness that are healthy, right? When you experience those bodily sensations, that's like the red light going off on your dashboard in your car, alerting you to a problem in your car. So the bodily sensations are like an alert that are helping you to see that there's some discontentedness that's about to arise, take some action. So if you can get ahead of the curve in realizing that these bodily sensations are there and that they're occurring, you can get way ahead of the ball game here. Because if you allow that anger to come into the mind as feelings and then start affecting the condition of the mind, now you gotta deal with that for multiple minutes, multiple hours, multiple days. But if you can cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation, wow, you've just saved yourself a whole lot of trouble because you never allowed the anger to come into the mind to begin with. Thank you very much, sir. Chrissy has a question. Yes, sir. Thank you. So I'm wondering if when you notice the bodily sensations and or the feeling and you cut it off or you redirect the mind, is this when you want to guard the doorway to the senses? Um, the, the mindfulness is the guard. Right. So if you're having mindfulness and you're aware, like, oh, here comes some bodily sensations, that's the guard. That's like the security guard at the door, the mindfulness. And now when you see the bodily sensations, you cut it off and let it go there. It's like shutting the door, not letting the person come in. Right. It's not letting the discontent feelings come in. So the guard or the guarding of the doorways is the mindfulness. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly give me more examples of guarding the doorway to the senses? Because there is some confusion still, I think. Sure. So say that mm -hmm. I say that I uh, I know that I have a craving that I want the house to look a certain way and it has to look a certain way. And I'm coming home from work and I know that I have this craving. And if I walk into the house and I see things that aren't in the right place, the mind gets angry and it gets so frustrated, right? Well, if I know that about this mind and there's that craving that's there, then when I'm on my way home and I'm in the driveway, I'm already telling the mind, hey, things are not gonna be the way you think when you walk into this house. Because of impermanence, things are not gonna be in the same place that you want them to be in. So when you walk into this house, just be calm, just be patient, just understand that this house is impermanent and it's not possible for things to be in the exact same spot that you want them in all the time. So now with that awareness, now I walk into the house and I have this mindfulness and this awareness and I look in the living room and there's a little mess there. Oh, Right away, the mind's like, oh, that's impermanent. That's, that's okay. I'm just going to go to the kitchen, get myself a glass of water. Whatever is in the living room is in the living room. No big deal. So this is guarding the mind with mindfulness, that you can kind of prepare the mind before you go into a situation. And then when you go into the situation, you're aware of the mind getting ready to experience discontentedness when it sees something like a little mess in the living room, for example. Okay, I think I understand now. So guarding the doorway isn't avoiding the doorway. It's preparing for the doorway. Right. It's preparing and it's also when the doorway sees something that is starting to arise discontentedness, the mind can see it right away. It can see it. It can observe it. Oh, mess in the living room. Oh, I'm not going to allow the mind to get angry here. I'm guarding the doorway. I'm not going to let the anger come in. I'm going to prevent that from coming in. I'm going to apply right effort and prevent that anger from coming into the mind. All right. I think I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, 
Sir, I think that's all the questions this time. Thank you very much for your teaching, Mr. Dean. All right, you're welcome. So what I'll do then is just in class with thanking all of you guys for attending and being interested and dedicated to learning and practicing these teachings. And then also share with you what we're gonna be doing in our next class. Our very next class is starting the retreat series, which is titled Harmony in Relationships. All of these classes for the next eight Sundays is going to be around creating harmony in your relationships. And the very first class is titled Practicing in a World of the Unknowing, Relationship, Relationships with Non-Practitioners. So what this class is gonna help you to understand is now that you've learned these teachings, but you're in a world filled with people who don't understand these teachings, how do you practice in relationships with people who aren't practicing these teachings? Because as part of this group learning program, <clears throat> you learned about how to love without attachment, that attachment is gonna lead to discontentedness. And you might be in a relationship with somebody that is attached to you and wants you to call them every day or text message you 20 times a day or, they might think that if you come to their house every day that that shows that you love them but you know that that's attachment and you're training your mind to not do those things so how do you function in a relationship with a life partner with children with a boss with co-workers with neighbors and people around you who don't understand these teachings because you're working on eliminating craving desire attachment and you're working on being calm but other people around you might like it when you're angry. They might like it when you're frustrated. They might like it when you argue with them. And they might think that that shows that you care because you argue with them. But now as part of this path, you're learning that arguing doesn't lead to anything wholesome. It's not wise to argue and you're choosing not to argue anymore. And then this person is like, hey, you don't care about me anymore. You never argue with me. Right. So how do you practice in this situation? How do you uh, have these relationships with people who aren't interested in practicing these teachings? All eight of these classes that I'm going to share are from the USA retreat from this past summer. And I've only ever taught them in that retreat. So I haven't written anything in the books about these. So over the next eight weeks, they're going to be individual classes. This first one happens to be titled Practicing in a World of the Unknowing, Relationships with Non-Practitioners. And I'll share that with you on Sunday. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna be doing loving kindness meditation together. So you're welcome to come together on Wednesday at the same time in order to meditate together where we encourage, support, and motivate each other. And remember, as you progress on this path, you're always welcome to reach out for help. You can post in the Facebook group, you can send me a private message, you can ask questions in these classes, or you can schedule a personal guidance session. All of these options are open for you to get personal guidance, and all the resources that I share are available for you at no cost. So thank you all for sharing your questions and asking questions and being diligent and uh, looking to understand these teachings over the last seven months. Because this is the last official class, um, even though we're going to be continuing week by week, I would like to just say anybody who has practiced generosity to share offerings with me, while I thank you individually as you do that, and while I thank you each month in the Facebook group, I would like to just end our group learning program by sharing my appreciation and my gratitude for your generosity and supporting me and sharing these teachings with everybody around the world. So if you've offered your time, your effort, your energy, or any resources or donations or anything like that, any kind of help or assistance that you've provided me, I would just like to thank all of you. Miranda has been a big support, Bossom, Tony, Rick, Chrissy is starting to help. There's been lots of people that have been supporting this community coming together. And I would just like to thank all of you, no matter how big or how small of a, of a support that you've been at any point in time throughout this program, I would just like to thank all of you and say, I really appreciate all the support that you're doing to bring these teachings into the world and diligently practicing them for yourself. So I'll see you guys all in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.